20 years hence, uh, I'd either be still kind of cranking around here, or I'm an old fashioned platinist in some of my uh, uh, Yeatsian moods. So maybe I'll be up in eternity by that particular point, really seeing the between from subspecie eternitatis, so to say. <laughs> Okay, that's a bit morbid, I know, for nine o'clock on a <laughs> Friday morning, but, but we philosophers, uh, you know, we make a profession of uh, metaphysical morbidity. Uh, um, the, 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 the paper I have, um, the title is primarily focused on Sean O'Reardon, um, and um, I thought though it might be a little bit helpful to you if I just say something in broader terms about how I understand the notion of the between and why it's particularly of interest to me uh, in a more existential sense and why then um, uh, uh, an Irish poet like Sean O'Reardon uh, has a particular interest uh, uh, to me. So this, 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 this little book, uh, Being Between Conditions of Irish Thought, um, it was published some years ago. Uh, I, 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 I could uh, stress some of the things that I mentioned there, but um, again, early in the morning, reading something uh, in a text has a tendency to, uh, if, if one could uh, put in a bottle the power of reading a text to send people to sleep, one could be, <laughs> become a millionaire fairly quickly. Um, so I will resist resorting to that vis dormitiva of the professor, um, even though it's e in one sense it's easier for me to read, in another, another sense I think perhaps in terms of more participative engagement it might be uh, uh, more prudent to try and at least uh, uh, to speak more e e e extemporaneously. Not extemporaneously, in the end of course. So this notion of being between. Um, there are philosophical dimensions to it, there are also existential and autobiogra autobi autobiographical dimensions to it in my own particular case. Uh, the autobiographical dimensions, first perhaps. Um, I grew up in Ireland, um, in the, born in the early 50s. It's an Ireland now to a certain extent that has disappeared, or at least it's certainly an Ireland that is under severe criticism by more recently developed uh, social, economic and ideological um, uh, tendencies. Um, in a certain sense, I think I grew up in the Middle Ages uh, because, again, the, the history of Ireland was still quite fresh in the minds of people and certainly in my own case, the presence of the Catholic Church was all pervasive in uh, the lives of ordinary people. I don't say that in any sense to make a, a, a denouncing judgment, as is often the case by uh, many advanced intellectuals today. Uh, but it's merely to, first of all, give a sense of an Ireland that has a long history, that in fact fosters a memory of length. The question for us today, I think, how long our memories are, how amnesiac we are vis-a-vis -vis longer traditions and inheritances. I think that's a huge theme um, in certainly the Irish situation, the human condition generally, between us and the past. Uh, it's not just a matter of rushing into the future with new possibilities, but rather sometimes the past has a r reserve of possibilities that keep returning to one. And I think that's particularly important with some of the great poets. Namely, they seem to strike out in a singular individual direction. The voice, in a sense, is their own, but in coming to their own voice, they discovered the voices of others. There's a pluralvocity, so to say, in reserve. Um, perhaps that's a, a, you know, for, a, a true of the human condition as a whole, but I think poets in particular are, they become attentive to the, the secret voices of the others that uh, come back to, to them. Uh, they may not necessarily be at home with those voices, but they articulate more than themselves. So this question of the more than self, this will be one of the themes that I'll return to uh, uh, in a little while in relation to Sean O'Reardon. Because we do live in an epoch where, you know, even going back to Dickens' uh, chuzzle wit at the beginnings of um, 
Bleak House. Uh, Chuzzle Witt, who are my Dickens specialists here this morning? Um, David Copperfield? No, it's not. No. Yeah. Anyway, he says, self, 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 self. Everyone is self, self, self. And of course, like the irony of the particular passage is that he's absolutely self-absorbed himself. But he, he, he denounces the epoch of the self. We, we do live in the epoch of the self in one sense, but we also live with the twin of self, namely, or are concerned with the other, and the other qua other. So I think this is a central concern in my own exploration of the between, um, that the between space somehow communicates an irreducible difference between us and others, and yet at the same time it's not a difference that has to be frozen into something like a dualistic opposition which turns us into opponents or perhaps even competitors or perhaps even enemies of the other. How, how do we uh, navigate this uh, middle space? So growing up in Ireland, but I came to America, I had done my BA and MA in University College Cork in uh, the late 60s, early 70s. And at that particular time in academic life in Ireland, the, the protocol really is that if you thought of having an academic future, you were to go abroad. You were to move into the beyond, so to say. And I came to America. I did my PhD here at Penn State, not far from here. Um, uh, I, I returned to Ireland for a short period and came back to America again, where I taught in Loyola College in Baltimore for a good number of years. I, w I at a certain point, went to Belgium <laughs> and uh, have, at the same time, this visiting chair here in Villanova for over 10 years now. So again, it, it, the autobiographical thing is an indication of uh, moving between. Uh, I, I have a very strong Irish sense of myself, but I've lived for extensive periods here in America. I've lived for extensive periods uh, in Belgium. So that sense of, again, plurivocity, uh, but in such a manner that doesn't necessarily lead to a betrayal of some of one's more original uh, uh, roots, so to say. Um, so the, the, the thing that I want to uh, just stress here at the moment is the notion of the between. And this gets a little bit philosophical. Some of you I know are, you know, died in the wool metaphysicians, so you'd be delighted to hear some of this um, more systematic exploration. But one of the philosophers that I've engaged with again and again, uh, sometimes more hospitably, sometimes more hostilely, is uh, the German philosopher Hegel. And Hegel is a philosopher who actually is marvelously strong in stressing mediation. There is a relationship between the self and what is other to it. There's a mediation between the self and what is other. But in the end, the mediation turns into what I call a self-mediation. The, the differences are gathered together in a unity. And the stress falls in the end on the unity rather than the difference or the otherness. So I've struggled with that, and one of the reasons why I struggled with that is when I came here to America, uh, Ireland was one world, and the US was a different world. Again, you're talking about now the very early 70s. And even though back into the 19th century and earlier, the navigation between Ireland and America is, is hugely important, hugely important for Ireland, hugely important for America. Nevertheless, you had two different worlds, and leaving one, to a degree, was uh, experienced as a kind of an exile. This notion of exile, for instance, we, that has been softened a lot now by cheap travel, for instance, easy travel, by the fact that we can get on the, you know, Skype without having to pay much money. The experience back then was quite different. If you left, you left, and a gulf opened up, and one was never sure if there was a return, or if those you left would uh, see you again or you would see them. So it was, it was stressed with a sense of separation, which, at least in my experience, the, the differences couldn't be simply unified, sublated into one whole. Again, that, that, that's how I see the Hegelian system. There are differences, they enter into opposition, they struggle with each other, and yet they point to a, a one whole within which all the differences are contained. Uh, my existential experience between Ireland and America was that you had two worlds, each of them a whole unto itself, but certainly at that point not reducible 
one to the other, not subsumable one into the other. So how to live with that sense of difference, how to live with, how to negotiate that between uh, doing justice to two different homes and doing justice also to the sense of, of, um, of, 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 of suffering that enters into that middle space. Um, in, in the decades that have followed, of course, with technological developments, um, the, a question for me has been, do, do people who leave their first home experience that in that same, with the same stress as earlier times? Um, now again, I, 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 I was in charge of an international philosophy program in Leuven, and I had many, many uh, American students coming there. And I would often say to them at the beginning of their visit that this is your first time abroad from America and is it the case that by being away something about what is back home comes home to you in a manner that would not come home to you if you had stayed at home? And invariably they respond yes. By being othered, by being away from home in a strange way, home comes home to one in not being at home. So this paradoxical doubleness of being at home in not being at home or not being at home in being at home. Uh, that's a crucial area of exploration in, in, in my own uh, philosophical thinking. So this notion of the metaxu, the meta there's a word which I, 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 I think I made it up, actually, but I mean, it's just two <laughs> words, met metaxological, metaxology. The word metaxu is the Greek word for the between, a word I first came across in Plato's Symposium, where he talks about eros as a daimon, that is metaxu between the human and the divine. Um, but my intuition was that, that this between was irreducible. That is to say, it wasn't subsumable into the total whole that we find so powerfully expressed in the Hegelian philosophy. So, uh, uh, the systematic exploration of this being between um, in philosophy itself, in uh, poetics, uh, in the philosophy of religion, in our ethical being, this has been at the center of, of my work in, in all of those years. Um, just keep an eye on the time. For today, what I wanted to do was to say something about Sean O'Riordan. And again, some of you may know the work of Sean O'Riordan. Could I ask you, put your hand up. I know you're not undergraduates, but uh, you know. <laughs> but, well, see, see the, the, these are my marvelous students over here. <laughs> they, they know something about Sean O'Riordan. <laughs> OK, so there are some, but. Um, He's a, he's a poet from Cork, which is again where I came from. Um, he was born in Ballyvourney, which is out in West Cork. And there was a, an Irish-speaking community there, which to some degree was a mixed Gaeltacht. Some people spoke English, some sp people spoke Irish. His, uh, his, his mother was English-speaking, his father was Irish-speaking. His grandmother was Irish-speaking, in a, in a, as sometimes people would say, in a more pure sense, stretching back. Uh, into earlier generations. So Aurier Dorn himself grew up uh, often hearing the speech of his grandmother and the older people uh, who had a rich Irish, um, a rich Irish that in his own poetic ventures he felt that he could never really quite live up to. So there's this sense of the loss of not merely a language but the whole world that goes with immediate access to a language that is very much part of his uh, poetic exploration. That, that, of course, brings up a whole story of the 19th century and the famine, the trauma to Ireland, the between that opened up vis-a-vis -vis emigration between Ireland and America, the loss of the language, it's, uh, the loss of the Irish language seen in the light of something that prevented one from economically prospering and the need for English uh, uh, to replace it as a way simply of making a living and uh, uh, moving on in the world. But uh, some years ago, uh, and, and Timothy knows this person, Louis de Poer, who's head of the Centre for Irish Studies in Galway, 
I, I was invited to Galway to give a talk uh, about my work and Louis himself was initially very worried that it would be too philosophical. The, uh, the Irish are very um, ironical, if not to say skeptical, of anyone who has highfalutin philosophical notions. I confess I have been the victim of that from a variety of uncles and aunts and, and, and even one of my grandmothers. Many years ago when I was younger and I was living back in Cork for a little while, there was a, there was a newspaper called the Cork Examiner and they had a, a, a magazine, one page every week, Tuesday magazine, they called it the Tuesday Mag and the editor of it, God rest his soul, Robert O'Donoghue, Donoghue was his name, he said, we need some thinking in this, uh, this page. So he actually offered me a column. It was usually poets, MacDarrell Woods, uh, Paul Durkin, people like that. These were people who went on to have quite uh, singular uh, careers in the poetics uh, in Ireland. But for, for, for the best part of 10 years, I was writing a philosophical column uh, in the Cork Examiner, which was read by a very small, <laughs> but hopefully <laughs> devoted uh, readership. But my story is this. I, I started by writing these uh, little vignettes of some famous philosophers like Hegel, and then I published a piece on Marx. And when my grandmother saw <laughs> that her darling grandson, William, was writing about Marx, she declared definitively, as if she had come down from Mount Sinai, William, you're finished. <laughs> <laughs> In those days, the association was Hegel. Hegel leads to Marx. Marx leads to Lenin, Stalin. And then they're shooting us. <laughs> so so I, I have been the victim of, because I have written about Hegel and Marx and people like that, that just to be associated with them was itself seen as uh, not merely worry, worrisome, but uh, not keeping good company, as we used to say, uh, being brought up, but uh, so so Louis de Puer was, was he told me, look, there's stuff in Sean O'Riordan that you should study more closely, particularly an introduction to Arabel Spadoiga, his first book of poetry, um, where he gives an introduction answering the question or asking the question, what is poetry, and uh, this was around the time that I was writing this at the request of Louis. But I just didn't. I just simply didn't have time uh, at that uh, point to to take it up more seriously. But in the years since then, and again, this is perhaps partly an advertisement uh, for the book, not my book. I mean, my books they make me a fortune. Uh, you know. <laughs> if you if you sell a thousand copies, it's a, it's a success, which means you know royalties ten years down the road of fifty dollars. You know. So. <laughs> We don't do it for the money, we philosophers. We do it for free. Um, but just to draw attention to Yale University Press published this selection of poems by Sean O'Riordan just a couple of years, two or three years ago. And it's bilingual. So you have the original, not all of O'Riordan's poems, but quite a, quite a nice selection, plus translations by a variety of hands. Uh, there are one or two poems that Sean O'Riordan himself um, uh, translated, and it's interesting to look at his English by comparison with his Irish. My own view is actually the Irish is extraordinarily evocative and suggestive, whereas the English is, is poetic, perhaps in a sense that isn't quite, he's not in the zone, so to say. Uh, and that's how he felt, in fact, that uh, it was in the Irish language that he uh, w was in the zone, poetically speaking, and dedicated his life uh, to that. Um, now, again, just let me keep an eye on the time. If, if, if someone could give me signals, if I'm, if, if I'm running out of time, um, hurry up, please, it's time, <laughs> since you're, <laughs> you're all great poetic. Um, uh, the, what, what interested me then when I did go to read through this, again, marvelous, really marvelous um, introduction to the question, what is poetry? It's marvelous because Aurier Dorn, uh, his formal education uh, ended at the end of high school. And he went into the city hall in Cork and had a job as some tax officer. I think motor tax, 
and in fact, like it was a bit of a crucifixion for him, from the point of view of what was fermenting in his soul vis-à-vis uh, poetic uh, desires. Uh, outwardly, he was a respectable uh, motor tax officer, but inwardly, his world was different. And it's that between that interests me. Again, it's that there are many, many betweens. Uh, but this, I call it the intimate metaxu, that the between can, for instance, take the form of exile and going to a foreign country and uh, going and coming, uh, passing over and passing back. But the thing, the notion of the between is as much imminent in the human being as, if you like, external to it in a variety of different forms. So this, this inner exploration of the intimacy of a between, between himself and himself. Again, this is, a, in fact, like one of his recurrent themes. Wh who is the true self? He talks about traveling from self to self, um, as if each self was a way station that in some sense revealed who he was, but in another sense uh, fixated him in terms of what he was not truly. So this passage between selves, this notion of selving, um, he actually quotes uh, Gerald Manley Hopkins's poem uh, as, as Kingfisher's catch fire. And it comes to the great line about each thing does one thing and the same uh, selves, this notion of selving. And as it turns out, in my own work, I've talked about selving, not just the self, but selving as a process which again has this plurivocal character, plurivocal in the sense that there, there are many formations of uh, or selving. And it's a question what the nature of that selving is. If you can't just simply fixate it on one form of the self and one form alone. Um, uh, O'Rear Dawn, I think, was driven into this exploration partly by the contingency of uh, contacting TB. At the age of 21, his father died from TB when he was, when, when, when Sean O'Riordan was 10. And they moved to a little place called Inniscara, which is just on the outskirts of Cork City. Still rural, but it's on the verge. So there's that question of the between vis-a-vis -vis the country. We used to call the country and the city. I, I, I lived in Cork City at a time when, I, from where I lived, you could just walk out into the country, and into the country meant going into orchards and stealing apples, or going into the fields of farmers and irritating um, them for trespassing on their lands and so on. So this porosity between uh, town and country, city and nature, understood actually in a quite elemental and uh, 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 sometimes inspiring sense. This was part of his, his upbringing. But at 21, when he had just started his job um, in the city hall, he contacted TB. And in those days, TB was incurable. Um, and as you know, the response in communities was to quarantine, essentially. Uh, the TB patient was taken into a uh, sanatorium, resting and so on, fresh air, all those kinds of things. He talks himself about not just that the patient was being helped back to health, but more that the, 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 the settled community was being protected from the person who was infected. And so from a very early age, his relation to his own body uh, uh, deeply troubled, not only troubled, but full of uh, suffering. Um, but also that is also manifested externally in the relationship between him and the external community. Um, uh, there is a, a, a great video by Louis de Puer, which is on um, Sean O'Rear Dawn. It used to be on YouTube, but they've taken it down for some reason or other. I fortunately managed to download it before whatever powers that be took it. But uh, in the house that he lived in, in Nascara, his uh, mother built an annex at the back. So uh, even within his own family, that sense of separation, that sense of separation which again is a threshold between normalcy and another space. And it's in that other space that um, his own efforts at poetic uh, creation took place. Um, uh, uh, in terms of human 
uh, even beyond his own first family, he did have a relationship with a, a woman, and uh, it seemed at one particular point that they might get married. Uh, eventually, they did not get married, even though, as I understand, the woman was willing to marry him. But uh, some people who knew him and scholars also wonder if he feared uh, infecting either his his wife, his lover, or his children. So, so TB, in its infectiousness in those days, um, carried not only just singular consequences for the patient, but also social consequences in terms of the form of life um, that the uh, person might choose. So again, the, the, the thought is proposed that precisely because of this condition like that, this, if you like, a certain kind of retraction into the depths of self. And again, you can just think about it this way. When you're suffering, I was thinking about this this morning. I wasn't suffering that much, to be honest with you. you know, just a little bit. You know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but when you suffer, you do retract into yourself. And the more extreme suffering causes you to retract even more. Um, and the question, of course, is that is th what, what happens in that retraction, that return into an intimacy over which at a certain point you have no control. And my thought is this, that you actually can come to a threshold where the pain can be so extreme that you want it to end, and you might want it to end sometimes perhaps by, um, by, by, by interventions that would perhaps kill you. Right? But so you, you come to a threshold in which in some sense you're facing nothing uh, but in extreme pain. And uh, the threshold, again, interests me, and I think it interested him, as that place where something like poetic uh, inspiration could eventuate. Being driven back radically into yourself, finding within yourself no stability, because you cannot master what's at stake. You cannot determine through your own autonomous powers completely what's happening. Can that threshold become an occasion where we become porous to something more than ourselves. Now, again, he, he, he doesn't describe it like that himself, but these are some of the thoughts about this intimate metaxu that I want to bring to bear on uh, uh, interpreting uh, Sean O'Rear Dawn. Uh, my, my, my hope is, I've written quite a lot, but just have a meditation in which, you know, for better or for worse, I think of myself as a philosopher. Uh, Sean O'Rear Dawn is a major Irish poet because of the the, 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 the notion that he brings Irish, the Irish language into the modern age. Um, but this notion of a dialogue between the philosopher and the poet is something that goes way back into the ancient world. Plato famously, as you know, expels the poets from his ideal state. So that quarrel, in, in Plato's time, it was already an ancient quarrel. Plato refers to the ancient quarrel of the poets and the philosophers. In the 20th century, the most famous one was between Hölderlin and Heidegger. Heidegger, the German philosopher, and uh, Hölderlin, the 19th century German poet. So this, 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 this space between the poetic and the philosophical interests me uh, deeply, and uh, this, is, this is one of the themes that I, 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 I'm working on. Um, OK, um, I, I know the time is going on. Just a few things, OK? And th th there is one poem which I thought I'd not recite. But I have his poems on my computer. <laughs> um, it's called Wallert, Mollert. It's, it's translated in English as switch. But it's about a man looking at a horse. <laughs> and the horse is very sad looking. And as Turnbull looks at the horse, something happens between them. And by, by the end of the, the, the eyes of the man looking into the eyes of the horse, there seems to be a switch in one sense, but there's this passage back and forth in which, at the end, the eyes that look out from the farmer Turnbull are, in fact, the, the, the melancholy eyes of the horse. So this, this switch. Now, I, again, I, 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 I don't like the word switch because a switch is instantaneous, whereas what's at play here is this passage back and forth, which does lead to a, a switch in you know, the notion of a gestalt switch where you're looking at it and then it turns into something else. There is the switch at the end, but it's the process of passage between oneself and what is other to one. And that is central, I think, in the uh, idea of poetic creativity, poetic um, 
poetic uh, inspiration, you know, rare dawn. So let me just get this. I, I, I. <coughs> okay. Sorry, it doesn't. Um, this is this is the voice of our or or I do these machines not obey you <laughs> when you want them to? I think that was one of the um you know when 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 the apple was eaten eaten in the Garden of Eden. God inscribed in the human condition that a machine is always going to fail. It's only 57 seconds, so I, 54 seconds. So I'll, I'll just play it again just for cool fun. Tea. Oh no, that's going on. That's, a, that, that's another famous cool one actually. Tea. Do you want to hear cool and tea? Okay, we'll leave it on. That's a great one. It's 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 a is Gair Mor Dov Marnaud Sitir, a Dramelig Hane, is Cat Kroon Gray. Sahoni here Tabau Drawi, is own to she on Taylor. Queen Lord Bukui Shan Hatati, is Trump a ball of Nater, is Kittel Ball Margail. Is own a Hagantin Kerry, Gamay Fatina Kerry, Tagail a Kulla Kulan Tea. Is be the dear Dirke, a whole gachti in it. But while I'm the whole on tea, some dead hurt good day. The dicking down a word galley on tolerance in Aesop is in a focal length. Okay, I see Mike, it's just ten to, it's almost ten to ten. But um, the um, <coughs> that 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 poem, uh, Cool of Tea, um, it talks about Tirna Nog. It's 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 on the syllabus for secondary school students now, so many of them know of it, and it's sometimes then identified as a as a as a kind of a, a, ch a child's poem. But in fact, it's a it's a wry poem which is full of uh, suggestiveness. Which is, you could I, I I mean at some point I will give a serious serious philosophical interpretation uh, where wryness uh, itself is full of uh, a certain profundity. But the, the Mahler thing, the, the, the switch, and again, uh, you know, just, in, just in the brief period that I have, he, 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 one of the major concerns, m major identifying factors that he talks about poetry, the first one is what he calls the open mind of a child. So uh, at the beginning of this uh, introduction about the nature of poetry, he talks about the child allowing the horse to pass into them. Whereas the father of the child, that doesn't happen at all. The father of the child simply hears the horse outside and the externality uh, remains. Whereas an intimacy of communication back and forth between the sound of the horse passing on the street and the child changes the child. And he has this marvelously suggestive notion that 
that everything has its, uh, has its prayer, that at, this, at a very, very deep level, to be is to be a prayer. Um, and again, that's a theme that could be taken up in far greater depth and extent, the relationship between the poetic and the sacred. Um, uh, but I, I just don't have time to do so. But the, the word in Irish is lanov, uh, which means an infant. Um, when we hear the child, a child, we think of someone perhaps a little bit older, but it, the word in Irish for an, a somewhat older child is a poista. So he's talking about a, a, an infant. And again, this is in the Irish, but the word infant itself comes from the word infans, which literally means without speech. So one could interpret this as, again, returning us to this intimate metaxu at a level before which the word itself is even born. So the, the infant is at that threshold across which, at a certain point, uh, the word will be born. Um, now, I, I would suggest that we are all born poetically into language in that particular sense. And again, that would be a deep question in the Irish situation where at one point, Irish was the language into which we were born. We talk about the mother language and the fact that the mother is mentioned is inseparable from a gestation and bringing to be out of a secret source of, uh, of, of, of generation. But we're all born into a language. But the, the interesting thing that I would suggest here is if there's a, a second birth, whether the poet is the person who in one sense returns to being a lanov, an infant, infans in the sense of without speech, but that the word is born a second time. And the second birth in a certain sense is the renewal of the first birth. Um, again, these are reflections that I would bring to bear on it insofar as poetic speech is not just simply a creation ex nihilo. Uh, the word that is poetically communicated is itself second to wording the between that has already taken place in a community. And if one is not in some sense tapped into the first wording or second wording can become just uh, you know, hollow and, and empty. Uh, one last thought this way. Think about it this way. Uh, we're, we're awake, right? But what if the poetic charge, he talks about a, a kind of a, a jolt, a get, startlement, wakens up a second time. And again, there's something paradoxical about this. One is awake, so how could you be awake a second time already being awake? And yet, th I think it's a, an it, it is a, 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 a genuine question to ask. When we do read something which in one sense is familiar, we're awakened, but there's that moment where a second awakening in already being awake occurs. Now, I, I think that um, this is very much bound up with the intimate metaxu, but one has to dwell in it and become porous. This is this notion of porosity again to what offers itself for communication there. Um, so I think I should just uh, stop there really given the time and perhaps the hopefully opportunity for some discussion. So, so thank you very much for... for, 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 for <laughs> Well, thank you, Professor Desmond, for awakening us, and there is time for questions. <laughs> Surely a second awakening is at hand. <laughs> you don't want me to take the chair's prerogative if you don't like two philosophers talk. But actually, I, I would ahead. like to ask you a question. You, I know you've also written on the, uh, the concept of the how, and I wonder how that might relate about suffering and pain. Oh, yeah. yeah I, 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 one essay that I wrote is called Being, Being at a Loss, Reflections on Philosophy and the Tragic. And I open it by citing uh, Lear. Howl, 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 howl. <laughs> OK, I'm not doing a very good howl. <laughs> <laughs> if you howl and laugh at the same time, it's not Lear's howl. But. Um, I try to argue that that's, a, that, that's it's, it's total communication in one sense, but it's on the threshold of what we normally take to be linguistic communication. And um, 
So these extremities of communication uh, interest me very much. And there are then when the, the dead Cardini is carried by him, um, this sense of never. And um, the, you know, you know, why should a, a rat, a dog, a horse have life and thou no life at all, at all? You will come again never, 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 never. Now again, it's, it's, I, I, I mean, it's just, you know, <coughs> extreme, but it's true to the extremities of the human condition that there's a certain singularity of once one exists and once only and never and never again in the mortal between in which we live here. So exploring those extremities, the poets, the best of the poets have, it seemed to me, done that. The philosophers, in my view, have not always been up to the spiritual suggestiveness of the poets. And uh, so I think the, some of the greatness of the poetic actually issues a challenge to philosophical thought. Could it do, in its own particular medium, something that answers to, or at least is companioning with the kind of spiritual honesty that you find in some of the greatest uh, poetic art? But uh, you see, you're on the threshold of speech, but it's the, the threshold of speech, where speech breaks down, is absolutely communicable. I just wanted to ask you about, you talked about philosophy, and I was thinking about philosophy of mind. So Truman's, uh, I, you know, he's famously criticized, I'm more of a lot of people, and it's uh, not me. Um, you know, just for those, when, when the first book was published, Arabel Spadoga, in 1951, I think, he was criticized very severely by Mara, Mara Makati, who is a distinguished poet in her own right, and she said that he didn't, he hadn't mastered the, the, the metrical art of traditional Irish poetry, and she accused him of uh, being, in a certain sense, kind of secretly smuggling, smuggling in romantic poets, Shelley, Keats, and so on. And um, it, it hit him very hard, in fact. And uh, again, as those who have studied him, he didn't publish a volume of poetry for another 12 years. So it, 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 it was a very severe blow to his own self-confidence in the Irish that he was speaking. So I think he always felt that, by comparison with his grandmother, he didn't have that access. He wasn't as porous to the secret sources of the language in a way that um, he saw in that earlier generation. Uh, I, I, would, I suppose his father was mixed, uh, but he would have been closer uh, to that. And, and in Ireland at that particular time, the, the, the language was lost in one sense, but the efforts to revive it, a tremendous amount of uh, cultural, spiritual energy was invested in it, and uh, not always with success. And um, so you sometimes had those, they were sometimes called just Irishians, who looked upon the Irish language as a kind of a sacred preserve that had to be kept pure. And hence a poet like O'Rear Dawn seemed to be mixing together things that somehow polluted the purity of the, of the, of the longer uh, tradition and source. And there is a poem that he wrote later on called Phil Arish, mm -hmm. Return Again, where he looks to Dune Queen in Kerry, which was a full Gwaeltacht at that time, and he, in a certain sense, idealizes it as a place. I, I think of it actually as a kind of like a spiritual place rather than an actual physical place. Uh, it's a place where somehow the language um, has a purity about it. You know, almost a kind of Adamic um, uh, paradisal sense that if one was there, one would be truly oneself because one would be in community with one's, with, with, with one's own people. But it, it, it hurt him very deeply. And, but the, the paradox is that the younger generation, they were absolutely electrified by the use that he made of Irish. That this, this poem called Eilacha Mavahar, the, the on the death of his, his mother, um, 
a younger generation, and, and some of them actually were associated with University College Cork um, uh, around this magazine called uh, Inta. The, the, a, a person who was a classmate of mine was Nuala Nigonal, who's gone on to a very distinguished career as uh, perhaps the premier poet in Irish. But they were, they, th 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 see, they came from a world which wasn't just simply a rural world. And trying to come to terms with the complexities of, of modernity, the por porosity, the permeability between Ireland and other cultures, uh, between one country and another, the porosity that bilingualism brings, um, and hence the idea that there's, you know, that there's, n there's no such thing as bad Irish so much as Irish that doesn't communicate in this truly en energetic sense. So, th so, so, so they didn't have that more backward-looking view of the purity of the language. And it's not that they were betraying the purity of the language, but the terms of life of late modernity had to themselves become the occasion of their own poetic work. And, 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 and O'Rear Dawn was a tremendous inspiration for that whole generation, you know. But uh, he, his, his life was, was, was a tough life because of his own illness and because of dealing. He was full of self-doubt and um, at times apologizing for his poetry. Um, he, you know, he, uh, when he was working in the city hall, this is in Louis de Puer's uh, video, the, the, the ladies that he was working with, they were Irishians, but they didn't realize that he was actually an acclaimed poet, had won a prize. And then they mentioned to him, hey, we, we heard that you won a prize for one of your poems. And he says, and we didn't know you wrote poetry at all. This is all in Irish. And he says, no. He just says, low, what, what do I write? Low doggerel verse. So this kind of, it, it, it's a kind of a, a humble put down in one sense. But at a deeper level, he must have known that there, you know, there were some of his poems that really took flight. Um, but as, you know, it's, a, it's a very, very good question. Really. And we, uh, I think Ireland still lives with that question of the porosity between what it means to be Irish in a more identifiable sense and the fact that we're in endless communication with so many other different cultures, coming into the country, going out of the country. Um, uh, and, and that, that's, that, that's our postmodern condition at the moment, really. But I just followed up by asking you, I remember that you published it, uh, with Sarsha and Bill, and yeah. Mark Bell, and Mark Bell, and he didn't allow translations. Yeah, yeah. And now we have, right, of course, right. yeah. two translations of Chris Right, that's right. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Other translations. That, again, that kind of right, John. Right, John. Not allowing. Yeah. To I think it was a mistake, really. You know, because you see, I mean, people who have a little bit of Irish. I had school Irish, and I mean, I've lived out of Ireland for a long time, but back and forth for periods. But you know, it's it's. I know it's there because when I'm in Ireland, you know, I, I, things come back. I think more. As I get older, I get younger, yeah. so to say. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I saw that I, ca I can't resist. You can define yourself whatever age you like now. There's a guy in Holland that is suing to take 20 years off his life. <laughs> <laughs> He's 69, he wants to be 49. <laughs> and he says when he goes on Tinder, 69 year old on Tinder, never been on it myself, I must try it. <laughs> but if he puts down 49, he gets lots of hits. <laughs> so, I mean, there's, a, there, there's an older audience here. Look, there's a future for us by going backwards. <laughs> well, I think on that encouraging note. <laughs>